Welcome back to Hardware Unboxed. Today we've got part two of our B550 VRM Thermal Performance Investigation. And this time around, I'll be looking at boards priced between $140 and $160 US. Now, quite surprisingly, AIBs have managed to cram eight B550 boards into this price range. We have three from MSI, two from Gigabyte, two from ASRock, and a single board from ASUS. Now, from ASUS, we have the Tough Gaming B550M Plus, but they do also offer the Prime B550 Plus, and that costs $150 US. So technically there are nine B550 boards crammed into this price range, but unfortunately the Prime Plus is just not available here locally in Australia, so I wasn't able to purchase it for this roundup. Anyway, without wasting any time, let's briefly go over each of these boards we have here on hand, and then of course we will dig into those VRM thermal results. Starting with the MSI B550A Pro, this is the cheapest board in this roundup coming in at $140 US. When compared to the entry level boards featured in our first roundup, there's not a lot extra on offer here in terms of features like USB ports, M.2 slots and so on. The IO panel for example features just four USB 3.2 spec ports with four USB 2.2 ports, though there is support for USB 3.2 type C at the front. Where the B550A Pro is a significant upgrade over the entry level boards is in its VRM, offering a 10-phase V-Core. From the IR35201 controller, MSI takes five signals, each of which is then doubled using an IR3598 phase doubler. Each of the 10 phases is driven by an Onsemi 4C029NFET on the high side, with an Onsemi 4C024NFET on the low side. And these are the same MOSFETs used by the B450 Tomahawk, the B550 Pro VDH Wi-Fi, and the B550 M Bazooka. There's just two more sets of them, and each phase feeds into its own dedicated inductor. So in terms of thermal performance, the B550A Pro should have a big advantage over those boards just mentioned. Now the last MSI Gaming Plus motherboard that I looked at supporting Ryzen processors was the X570 Gaming Plus, which cost $170 US, and was pretty awful in terms of VRM quality, at least given the price and the fact that the board donned a flagship AM4 chipset. It was really the kind of VRM configuration to expect to find on an entry-level B-series board. And proving that point is the $150 B550 Gaming Plus, which takes the X570 Gaming Plus VRM and expands its capacity by 25%. MSI is now taking five signals from the PWM controller, and this means there are two extra sets of MOSFETs. The components themselves are still the same, we're just getting more of them on a more affordable motherboard. As for the rest of the board, it's pretty standard. Though for just $10 more over the B550A Pro, you get a few nice features that extend beyond just the larger VRM. The pre-installed IO shield is a nice touch, as are the larger heat sinks, but other than that it is essentially the same board. Then for $10 more, MSI offers the B550M Mortar at $160 US, which I like to think of as kind of the micro ATX version of the B550 Tomahawk. In terms of V-Core VRM design, it is a step up from the previous two MSI models as it moves away from discrete MOSFETs by using eight ISL 993606 amp power stages. It is worth noting that although there are eight power stages, the board only features a four phase V-Core as MSI is doubling the components per phase rather than doubling the phases themselves. And this is something we've seen ASUS do for years now. We've seen good things from these 60 amp power stages in the past, so I am expecting good things from the mortar, especially relative to the competing boards. When compared to the B550 Gaming Plus, the mortar drops two USB ports from the IO panel, which I do find a bit disappointing. There is really no reason for MSI to remove those ports, so I would have rather seen them remain. But other than that, despite the MATX design, they are very similar in terms of features. Moving on to Gigabyte, we have the Gaming X, and this is another $140 standard ATX B550 motherboard. And like its direct competitor, the MSI B550A Pro, it also features a 10-phase V-Core VRM. However, Gigabyte's opted for lower quality on semiconductor FETs, so I'm not too confident in this board. The heat sinks are also very basic, it has to be said, so it will be interesting to see how the Gaming X handles the Ryzen 9 processors. As for board features, it is super basic. There's far fewer connectivity options on the IO panel when compared to say the MSI B550A Pro. The audio has been simplified, there's no USB Type-C, and there's also two less USB ports. And then there's also no USB Type-C front panel support either, no M.2 shield, and then just four SATA 6 gigabits per second ports, but the IO shield is pre-installed, so there is that. 
Still, when compared to the equally priced MSI B550A Pro, the Gigabyte B550 Gaming X does appear to be the inferior product, at least on paper. Stepping things up a notch for Gigabyte is their B550 Aorus Pro, which comes in at $160 US, making it $20 more than the Gaming X model. And for that small price premium, the Aorus Pro's VRM is significantly improved. The 12-phase V-Core takes half a dozen signals from the PWM controller and doubles them using ISL6617A phase doublers, each of which feeds into a Vichet SIC651C 50 amp power stage. The heat sinks cooling these power stages aren't particularly impressive, but regardless of that, I'm still expecting good things from this board. Moving past the VRM, the rest of the board design and feature set is quite good. The IO panel configuration, for example, is similar to that of MSI's B550 Gaming Plus, but here you're also getting 2.5 gigabit LAN support. The audio codec has also been upgraded slightly to Realtek's ALC 1200 with higher quality capacitors. The only downgrade here is the inclusion of just four SATA ports, but still overall a good looking board and I am keen to see how it performs. Next up we have the ASUS Tough Gaming B550M Plus, which comes in at $160 US, though for $10 more you can get a standard ATX version, which features the exact same VRM and the same heat sinks, so in terms of VRM thermal performance, the micro ATX and standard ATX versions of this board should be exactly the same. And for this one, ASUS has gone with a very basic V-Core VRM design, much like what we saw with the MSI B550M Mortar. It's a four-phase design using doubled-up components, so each phase consists of two Vichet SIC63950 amp power stages. Then cooling all the VRM components are two reasonably large aluminium heat sinks. So while the VRM certainly looks solid, the rest of the board, if I'm honest, is pretty basic given the price. There's no pre-installed IO shield, and the IO panel itself offers a fairly typical array of connectivity. For example, there are four USB 3.2 Gen 1 ports, two USB 3.2 Gen 2 ports, and two USB 2.0 ports. ASUS has included 2.5 gigabit LAN support, so that's nice, but on board the rest of the features are pretty standard, and again, no front USB Type-C, and just four SATA ports. The cheapest board in this roundup is the ASRock B550 Pro 4, though it is just $5 less than the MSI B550A Pro and Gigabyte B550 Gaming X. In terms of VRM design and cooling, it is 100% identical to the Micro ATX version we looked at in the previous roundup, so it's not amazing, but it should be good enough given the price. And what we're looking at here is a six-phase V-Core using phase doublers. Each phase features a Sinopower SM4337 FET on the high side, with a Sinopower SM4336 FET on the low side, feeding into a single inductor. It's without question the weakest V-Core VRM of this roundup, but it's also the cheapest board. Then finally, we have the ASRock B550M Steel Legend, which steps up to $155 US, and for that extra $20, you get a seriously big upgrade in terms of VRM quality. This time, ASRock has built an eight-phase VRM using phase doublers, but more crucially, they've dropped the cheap Sinopower discrete FETs in favor of Vachet's SIC 654 50 amp power stages, radically enhancing the board's current capabilities. The B550M Steel Legend is really a direct competitor to MSI's B550M Mortar, and in terms of features, it is quite good offering half a dozen USB 3.2 ports on the IO panel, along with two USB 2 ports, and like the Mortar, 2.5 gigabit LAN is also on offer. The rest of the features are very similar across the two boards, so the key determining factor here could be VRM performance. But before we get to the graphs, let's talk about the test conditions. For this testing and any future AM4 VRM thermal testing, I've built a dedicated system with the help of Corsair, who sent over their Obsidian Series 500D mid-tower case, RM850X power supply, IQ H150i RGB Pro XT all-in-one liquid cooler, and 32 gigabytes of their Vengeance RGB Pro DDR4-3200 memory. The Obsidian 500D has been configured with a single rear 120mm exhaust fan and then two top mounted 140mm exhaust fans. Then in the front of the case we have the H150i 360mm radiator with three 120mm intake fans. This is a pretty standard configuration at least for a higher end system. Uh, the airflow is good and in a 21 degree room I'd say this is an optimal setup. For recording temperatures I'm using a digital thermometer with K-type thermocouples and I'll be reporting the peak rear PCB temperature. Finally, I'm not reporting delta T over ambient, instead I maintain a room temperature of 21 degrees, and to ensure a consistent ambient temperature, a thermocouple is positioned next to the test system. 
Now for this testing, we have four configurations using three different Ryzen processors. The base configuration, which every board should pass with ease, sees us use the Ryzen 7 3700X. It's a low powered part that only draws about 85 to 90 watts in our blender stress test. Then we have the Ryzen 9 3900X, which will be tested completely stock, no overclocking for that part, and no changes made to the BIOS other than loading XMP. And I should note that all motherboards have been tested with the latest available BIOS at the time of testing. The 3900X configuration pushes CPU load up to 140 watts in our test. Then we have the Ryzen 9 3950X, which has been tested twice, once stock and then once with a 4.3 gigahertz overclock using 1.375 volts. The stock configuration again only pushes CPU usage to around 140 watts, but it does so at a lower stock voltage. So we are pulling slightly more amperage, which will put a little bit more load on the motherboard's VRM. Finally, the 4.3 GHz configuration pushes CPU power consumption right up to 200 watts, so this is our most extreme test. So to summarize, all testing has been conducted in a well-ventilated case in a 21 degree room, so I consider these conditions to be best case. Okay, so starting with the Ryzen 7 3700X results, here we find low operating temperatures for all eight boards. The MSI Mortar and ASUS Tough Gaming both peaked at just 40 degrees, while the Gaming Plus reached 41 degrees. The Steel Legend, 43 degrees, and the Aorus Elite, 45 degrees. Beyond that though, the cheaper boards were noticeably hotter, especially the Gigabyte B550 Gaming X. So let's move on to see how they handle the stock Ryzen 9 3900X. Here we see that again, all eight boards passed with relative ease, though the Gigabyte Gaming X and ASRock Pro 4 were considerably hotter than the rest of the boards tested, peaking at over 70 degrees. When you consider the fact that the MSI B550A Pro is in the same price range, it does make the Gaming X and Pro 4 results all the more disappointing. The best board here in terms of VRM thermal performance is the MSI Mortar, though it was only 2 degrees cooled in the Gaming Plus, and really, with just 8 degrees separating the Mortar and the B550A Pro, the margins between these boards and then all of the boards between them are fairly insignificant. So we have half a dozen B550 boards delivering excellent results in this test. And we see that upgrading to the Ryzen 9 3950X delivers more of the same. The VRM temps have increased, but the margins remain much the same. The MSI B550M Mortar is again the best performer here, again beating the Gaming Plus by 2 degrees. Then we have the Tough Gaming at 56 degrees, the Steel Legend at 57 degrees, the B550A Pro at 58 degrees, and the Aorus Elite at 59 degrees. So again, very little separating these boards. But again, it is the Gaming X and Pro 4 that are quite disappointing here. Although a peak VRM temperature of around 80 degrees is perfectly acceptable, it's still a disappointing result given that the boards that aren't a great deal more expensive yielded much better results. Finally, we have the Ryzen 9 3950X overclocked results with the CPU running at 4.3 GHz with 1.375 volts, and the only B550 board to fail this test was the Gigabyte Gaming X throttling the CPU after about 30 minutes. The ASRock B550 Pro 4 also ran hot, but it peaked at 105 degrees, and after an hour it didn't throttle the CPU, so that's at least a pass in our test. The ASRock Steel Legend was again a big improvement, dropping the peak temperature by almost 20 degrees. Then we see a further 8 degree drop with the Aorus Elite, and at that point we're under 80 degrees, which is a very easy pass. Similar attempts were also seen with the B550A Pro and Tough Gaming. Delivering the best results were once again the MSI Gaming Plus and Mortar. Interestingly, this time the Gaming Plus was able to match the Mortar, peaking at just 71 degrees, which is an amazing result given the conditions. And for those of you wondering, under the exact same test conditions, the MSI X570 Gaming Pro Carbon hit 115 degrees and it throttled the CPU there, essentially failing this test. Now, here's a look at all the B550 boards we've tested to date, along with the B350 and B450 Tomahawk boards included for reference. I'm going to skip looking over the Ryzen 7 3700X results again, and just start with the Ryzen 9 3900X. The only boards to slip into the entry-level range here was the Gigabyte B550 Gaming X and the ASRock B550 Pro 4, the two cheapest boards featured in this latest roundup. Keeping that in mind, they still get blown away by the MSI B550M Bazooka. And it's a similar story with the Ryzen 9 3950X, though the added load does help the more expensive boards like the Aorus Elite and A Pro to distance themselves from boards like the B550M Bazooka. Then finally, with the 3950X overclocked, 
it's again more of the same. Though of course the Gigabyte B550 Gaming X did fail this test, along with the MSI B350 Tomahawk. It is interesting to see that although boards such as the B550M Aorus Pro and B550M DS3H ran even hotter, they did avoid throttling the CPU. Though I think it's fair to say given the high operating temperatures you could probably fail these boards, they're obviously not ideal candidates for Ryzen 9 overclocking. Okay, so we've now looked at 15 B550 motherboards priced between $95 and $160 US. And most of the boards tested so far have been quite good in terms of VRM thermal performance, with just a few models I recommend you avoid. In the first roundup, the ASUS Prime B550MA, that stood out as the only poor quality board and it failed our OC test. It was actually unable to stabilize the 3950X at 4.3 GHz at all with any kind of voltage. The Gigabyte B550M Aorus Elite, B550M Aorus Pro, and B550M DS3H, they were disappointing. But it is worth noting that outside of overclocking, they were good enough with the Ryzen 9 processors. In this latest round of testing, it's really only the Gigabyte B550 Gaming X that we recommend you avoid if you plan on overclocking. For stock usage though, it is good enough, providing decent airflow in a reasonably cool room, and the same really does also apply to the ASRock B550 Pro 4. For those in higher ambient environments that want to run stock Ryzen 9 processors in core heavy workloads, the MSI B550M Bazooka is about as weak as you'll want to go. Though in that case, I'd suggest the MSI B550A Pro. It still costs $140 US, but it features a substantially better quality VRM design. On that note, for those of you concerned about VRM temperatures, you really can't go wrong with the MSI B550A Pro, ASRock B550M Steel Legend, the ASUS Tough Gaming B550M Plus, MSI B550 Gaming Plus, or the MSI B550M Mortar. Those boards were all excellent. And really, that does conclude part two of our B550 VRM temperature testing. If you enjoyed this video, please give it a like, and if you'd like to join us over at Patreon for some pretty cool perks, behind the scenes videos, monthly live streams, Discord chat, all that stuff, check it out, the link is in the video description. But other than that, thank you very much for watching. I'm your host, Steve, and I'll see you again soon.